by now. Amy, are you here? I'm here. Hi. Hey. Yeah, so the next talk will be by an, uh, Amy Bonser, and she will talk about um, what draws as tool to trace the composition of uh, and geology of exoplanets. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. And thank you, firstly, to the organizers of this seminar series, because I have to say it's an amazing seminar series, and I'm so pleased to be part of it and hope, looking forward to some discussions over coffee afterwards. Um, so I'm gonna talk about something slightly different now. Um, and I'm gonna talk about white dwarfs in the context of planetary systems and how we can use white dwarfs to learn about planets. Sorry to interrupt, uh, you yep. don't have it in full screen mode. I don't, oh, thank you. Let's sort that out then before I go further. I don't know if you uh, are using two screens. Uh, Is that better? Oh, that was good. Yes. That's good. Okay. Super. Thank you for the interruption. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd like to thank the people listed here um, as my collaborators who've been crucial to all of this work. Um, and I'm afraid today's going to be a little bit of a whistle stop tour of many different projects. But if you're interested in any of these, please do get in touch or talk with us in the coffee break afterwards. Um, and we can fill in all the details. So I thought I'd start by putting up this kind of portrait. Um, and I kind of like this image because it makes um, this kind of comparison between white dwarfs and Earth and makes them look very similar, which of course they are in terms of size. But in terms of properties, these are two radically different ob objects from our kind of rocky, very stable planet that we all live on um, to this huge high surface gravity of um, a white dwarf star that's very, very luminous. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today is how we can use white dwarfs um, actually to further our understanding of our own planet Earth and of other rocky planets that potentially exist and we know exist in other exoplanetary systems. Um, and we can do this because of the unique properties of white dwarfs and the fact that we have this very thin hydrogen helium atmosphere that should be clean, devoid of anything else other than hydrogen helium. Um, and instead, in a huge number of cases, we now find the presence of heavy elements or metals, things like iron, magnesium, calcium, carbon, man even manganese on the plot here from Zizu. Um, and these um, planetary, so these metals are evidence for the recent accretion of some material. Um, and that material has originated in an outer planetary system. So we can imagine something um, what do I put next now? on the lines of our solar system, that when it evolves to become a white dwarf, that outer planetary system remains and survives. Um, and what's so unique about a white dwarf is that we're able to detect something like a asteroid that in our solar system would appear as a sun grazing comet or would disappear totally within the so complicated solar spectrum. It shows up um, in the atmosphere of that white dwarf. Um, and so in the next kind of 20 minutes, I'm going to run through um, several projects that we're doing here in Cambridge that are all to do with um, using the abundances that we see in the atmospheres of white dwarfs um, to understand more about the geology and the composition of exoplanets. Um, and so I'm going to start out by talking about how we get planetary material in the, in the atmosphere of white dwarfs and some recent insights from Mark Browers. Um, I'm then going to continue to talk about um, some new examples of um, white dwarfs where we can see really interesting and exciting abundances of planetary materials. Um, and then I'm going to talk about John Harrison's work that attempts to explain these abundances using Bayesian models um, and um, finish up by talking about two projects that look into basically how planet formation can alter planetary compositions using white dwarfs as a tool and then also using the abundances of, um, that we observe in the atmospheres of white dwarfs to determine the geology of those planetary bodies, but then also how we can use those geological features to determine how large the planetary bodies were that were created, those, um, created by those white dwarfs um, in a really nice study by An Andrew Bracken. So all of um, the people listed here, hopefully will be around later if you'd like to talk to them or get in touch by email or, um, yeah, we would love to hear from you. So um, it's going to be very much a whistle stop tour, as I said. Okay, so let's start. Um, start out with our planetary system. 
And think, and I think of this mainly from the perspective of imagining that we had an exoplanetary system that could orbit a star like our sun, or maybe even main sequence A star, slightly more massive, that has planets and asteroids. That star then evolves to become a white dwarf, losing mass, that leads to the expansion of that planetary system, and potentially the destruction of the inner regions of that planetary system, but the outer planets and the outer belts of asteroids or comets, if they exist, can survive. And so you end up with this white dwarf that looks kind of rather like this, where you have your white dwarf in the center, um, potentially some planets orbiting on kind of 10 AU scales, maybe five AU being the closest in that could survive, and a belt of asteroids or comets. And exoplanetary systems are incredibly diverse, so this belt of asteroids or comets could be inside here, it could be outside. Um, but the basic theory is that these planets, as they do just in our solar system, but uh, once you become a white dwarf and you've lost mass, the influence of these planets increases and they're able to scatter material. Um, and there've been many, many papers talking about different mechanisms for how this can work. I've tried to list a few here, but apologies if I've missed out your favorite um, reference. But the point being that you end up with an asteroid on a highly eccentric orbit. Um, and so we talked about the high surface gravity of these white dwarfs. And that means that that asteroid, once it approaches within a solar radius, that's like several hundred white dwarf radii of that white dwarf, is torn apart and shredded to pieces. Um, and so those pieces are what accretes onto the white dwarf and produces the polluted white dwarf that we can see. So I'm um, kind of going to use this cartoon to kind of tell us about how planetary material arrives in the atmosphere. So, um, and this is from Mark Brown's paper. So we kind of have stellar mass loss, which is injecting an asteroid potentially into the inner system on that highly eccentric orbit. That asteroid is torn to pieces and tidally disrupts, forming this um, disk of essentially of shredded fragments that's very, very eccentric and potentially has, um, as Uri Malamud showed recently, a very large um, width in the outer regions of that disk. But we need something to happen to this disk. It's not enough to just form this disk. We need some process to help us to get that material onto the star. And so what Mark did is we proposed two processes um, that could do this. And one of these is um, to do with precession from GR. Um, and another is to do with scattering. And both of these learn, lead to orbital perturbation. So essentially these fragments on these pristine orbits now end up on crossing orbits. And that leads to collisions collisions grind down the material into small dust um, and that small dust can accrete via drag forces onto the star so that could be pointing Robertson drag or it could be gas drag um, that enables that accretion onto the star. Um, and so um, Mark pr proposed two ways that you can get these um, orbital perturbations, excuse me. And one of those um, is that if you had a planet that scattered your bodies inwards to start with that that planet, you can imagine this planet is here, this is your disk of initial material that was that has been disrupted and has been scattered in with. This planet's not going away, it's still orbiting at 6 AU, if it was at 6 AU when it scattered in the asteroid. And therefore these fragments continue to be scattered, um, but now they're on slightly different orbits with different apocenters, different positions, and therefore they're scattered different amounts. And that leads to collisional evolution, collisional grind down, and the small dust that enables you then to form this eccentric disk, which gradually circularizes and accretes onto the star. Alternatively, white dwarfs, um, the gravity is so strong that in those inner regions, you're actually subject to general relativistic precession on kind of millions of year time scales. And that's enough to lead to these fragments having crossing orbits, which again leads to collisional grind down and accretion of these bodies onto the white dwarf. Um, yes, yeah, so there's much, much more than just all of this inside of Mark's paper. So I'd really encourage you to take a read or have a chat with Mark afterwards, but those were the main two key points. Um, yeah, so then as that material accretes into the white dwarf, we're able to see it within um, the atmosphere of those white dwarfs. Um, and we can see different elements. So we can see elements such as rocky things, such as magnesium here in the spectrum of this um, white dwarf that's part of a paper by Laura Rogers, um, looking at seven polluted white dwarfs that also have gas that will be out shortly. Um, we can see rocky species such as magnesium and silicon. We can see um, Volatile, such as oxygen, that tells us about um, potentially the volatile content of those planetary 
bodies. So then we need to interpret what we're seeing in terms of um, in the abundances. Um, and this is um, absolutely crucial because we can see a range of different elemental abundances in the atmosphere of the white dwarf, but we don't necessarily know how those relate to the abundances in the planetary body that was accreted. And we need to know, make that um, correlation, or we need to understand that if we're really to use these white dwarfs to interpret what's going on. And then additionally, it'd be really nice to learn about those planetary bodies and to learn about the key processes that are controlling their abundances and how similar they are to the processes that control the abundances of planetary bodies within our solar system, that control the abundances or the composition, the bulk composition of our own planet Earth, for example, but also the asteroids and the Kuiper. Um, and so to do this, we um, set up a, um, a series of Bayesian models that take into account um, various processes and try and analyze the abundances in terms of the most likely scenario. So the first issue is the relative sinking of elements, because already once you're in the atmosphere of the white dwarf, if things sink at different rates, then um, the abundances change from what that planetary material was originally. But by making some suppositions about um, the plausible prices or the plausible abundances that you could have, we can actually um, place some quite interesting constraints on the most likely um, phase of accretion that each system is in. So in addition to this, that planetary body that has accreted onto that white dwarf, it might be formed in a planetary system where the um, overall abundances of that planetary system, the composition of that initial cloud of molecular gas, which collapsed to form those planets and the star, may have had a composition that was quite different to the composition of our solar system, for example. And we can see that range of compositions reflected just, for example, if we look at a sample of nearby stars and we study their compositions, we see a big range of different compositions. And it's the same kind of um, processes that would be reflected in, in those planetary bodies that form in those samples. So within our models, we can we consider this possibility of a range of initial abundances based on galactic um, evolution. And then we look at two key things. We say, well, our, we know that planetary bodies lose volatiles during planet formation. That's a key process. Whenever you have heating, you sublimate or you evaporate things. Or if you're too hot, you only condense into the solids, the things that have um, condensation temperatures um, above whatever your temperature is. And this can be as simple as Earth is a rock, it's not a comet. But it can also include very complex things like the fact that Earth actually has less sodium than, for example, chondritic meteorites, which form slightly further out in the disk. And then most excitingly of all, I find we look into the geology of these planetary bodies and we think about this idea of could they have formed an iron core? And can we deduce um, some of the properties of that iron core based just on the abundances that we're seeing? Yeah, um, so the code, I kind of said, it uses Bayesian analysis to try and um, determine the most ex a likely explanation for abundances in a given system. It can also tell you which other explanations are plausible, are consistent within the error bars, um, which ones are required to have core or mantle differentiation compared to which ones, which ones are not. Um, so we're quite excited about our models. Um, they were developed by John Harrison. John Harrison's now left the field, but um, Andrew Buchan has been um, further developing the models and has made them public on GitHub. So if anyone's interested in using them at any point, please get in touch with Andy and he, I'm sure he would be very, very happy um, to talk you through. Okay, so let's have some examples of what we can do with, the, with these abundances. Um, so I'm gonna show a few plots like this and I'm aware that they're um, not the easiest plots to interpret at first glance. And we spent far too long looking at plots like this. So I'll just talk you through them to start with. Okay, so. This is the abundances that we see in the atmosphere of a given white dwarf of various elements, such as aluminum, titanium, calcium, nickel, all plotted here with error bars. Um, and, it, and what we're plotting is the abundances relative to magnesium, relative to solar abundances. Um, and why we do that is it enables us to plot in the middle here, this kind of gray, region here, which is, I said, we had an array, a range of initial compositions that might be plausible for um, the initial 
planetary material that was forming in our planetary system. Um, and that kind of range sits around solar. It tells us about what might have been there in nearby stars and what we might have started with when we started forming our planetary system, our planetary bodies. And then what's really exciting is the kind of differences that we see in the bodies that have been accreted by from white dwarfs relative to this kind of um, narrow range of starting conditions. I haven't actually shown any here, but we do see a lot of white dwarfs that sit nicely within this kind of range of initial starting conditions. But this particular object is really exciting because um, it's been depleted. Third, and actually even, and also the calcium and the titanium are slightly higher. Um, and so this kind of, we can explain this, that this body potentially experienced quite hot temperatures during formation, just like Earth did relative to chondritic meteorites. And so it's depleted in these moderate volatiles that include sodium. So not only can we find bodies that are um, rocky within white dwarfs, we can even probe more precise um, differences in exactly what was going on during formation. Yeah, um, so all of this kind of brings us together to this story of saying, well, actually what we really wanna know is let's take a planetary system and let's say we start out with an initial composition and what we wanna know was when planet formation happened within that planetary system, what were the key processes that changed the abundances of those planetary bodies? And um, how did those key processes um, go on to form, say, an Earth-like planet or a potentially not Earth-like planet? Um, and which ones are really, really important in controlling the composition um, of planetary bodies? And so we've already seen a bit how the white dwarf observations individually can help us to do this because we can find the most likely explanation for the composition of every individual system. Um, but I'm now gonna talk about um, uh, even more precise way of working out exactly how planet formation changed the abundances of a given, in a given planetary system. Um, and so this technique relies on the fact that planets and stars both form out of the collapse of the same cloud of nebula gas. And at the same time, that collapse of that cloud of nebula gas is likely to form not just one star, but multiple stars. And so this means that stars in binaries tend to be chemically homogeneous. So the compositions of stars in wide binaries included these things where the binary companions may be thousands of AU away, those tend to have similar compositions. Um, and the fact that these wide binary pairs are chemically homogeneous, they formed out of that same material, that gives us this unique route to, to working out what the initial abundances were for the planetary material that went on to form the planetary body that was accreted by our white dwarf. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take planetary white dwarfs with K-dwarf companions, and we're gonna look at the abundances of those K-dwarf companions and use those to tell us what the initial conditions were for planet formation. We can then look at the material accreted by that white dwarf and say, hey, how did it change? How did planet formation change this process? And so we're just right at the start of, um, of this project, um, but I'm really, really excited by it because I think it has so much power to tell us so much about the details of what's going on in terms of planet formation. And so we published earlier this year, actually last year now, um, the first um, object that we studied in this, and this was a wide binary companion, sorry, the white dwarf is actually the companion to a K dwarf. And that white dwarf has accreted what looks like a cometary body that's very volatile rich with lots of oxygen, even a nitrogen detection. Um, we were able to analyze the abundances in that K dwarf binary. Um, so these are shown here in blue as compared to the white dwarf abundances in green. And we were able to show that actually this idea that planetary bodies do take on the abundances in refractory species of that initial cloud of planetary material is correct. Um, um, because the abundances here match very well in the refractories between both the wide binary companion and the white dwarf. Um, and this is a comet, so actually even the volatiles, even the oxygen matches. And intriguingly, carbon is consistent to within two sigma, but it's not the same. And um, so, yeah, it's very, very kind of um, provocative to think about whether maybe this means that 
um, potentially there's evidence for some slight volatile depletion that you would see in a comet in our solar system. And for exoplanets, this is really, really exciting because it means that when you detect a rocky exoplanet, you don't know what that rocky exoplanet's made from. It's really, really hard to find out. You've just got a density and that's it. But if you can use the composition of the star, that can really help break some of the degeneracies and trying to model what the composition of that rocky exoplanet is. And this work shows us that that um, hypothesis is indeed correct. Okay, so moving on again, sorry for the swift tour of many, many things. Um, I'm now going to talk about some of these white dwarfs where we can see evidence for geological processes. So, um, oh, yeah, okay. Um, so when we think about our planet Earth, we think about our planet in the planet that we live on, we sit on the surface, we're able to have a look out at the mountains, at the oceans, but really, actually, what's really, really fundamental to our existence, the fact that there are mountains, the fact that there are volcanoes, is the fact that our planet actually um, is a differentiated body with this, with a core and a mantle and a crust. Um, and that occurred because there was this phase of large scale melting where our planet heated up and became a magma ocean, it was molten. And when it was molten, iron and other elements such as nickel and chromium that go with the iron is heavier than the rest of the silica that's all sat there melting. So then iron droplets fall when they sink down towards the center and then they end up with you forming this lovely iron core in the middle of your body. Um, and actually that same process of forming an iron core happens even in asteroids in smaller bodies in our solar system. Um, and what's really, really exciting is that when we look in the um, abundances of planetary material that we see in the atmospheres of white dwarfs, we can probe this process of core formation. And that's because we can see elements that would stay in the core, things like iron, nickel, and chromium, and we can compare their abundances to things that would stay in the mantle, like silicon, calcium, um, and so forth. And so this only works if we were to accrete the whole of Earth, we wouldn't see it in the atmosphere of the white dwarf. Whereas asteroids sat around in an asteroid belt or a planetesimal belt in another planetary system. And they sat around for millions of years, if not billions of years. Those planetesimal belts are collisional systems. We know that, that's how we observe debris disks um, and how we're able to see them. We know that there's lots of collisions between these bodies. And if some of those asteroids have formed iron cores, then if there were super violent collisions, which um, will occur in some cases, then, you can split that body up into different chunks, but because you've already separated the iron from the silicate mantle, sometimes those chunks don't have the same ratio of, of iron core material to silicate mantle as the original body. So then when you do this many, many times during the long collisional history of your planetary system, and then at random, the white dwarf, some of these bodies get scattered by planets, most of them get ejected and occasionally one gets into the atmosphere of a white dwarf. If it happened to be one that was really core rich or if it happened to be one that was really just mantle material, then that shows up in the spectra of the white dwarf and we're able to see, um, the, we're able to see um, enhancements or depletions of elements such as iron relative to silicon, calcium, and aluminum. So, okay, so it's the dreaded plot again, but here we're, we're looking at the elemental ratio to magnesium. And again, it's normalized to solar abundances. These are the gray is the kind of range of initial conditions. So what you would expect if you just took stellar material and plonked it into the atmosphere of the white dwarf. Um, and then this is a really exciting um, object, GG61, that's accreted um, lots of different metals. And we've got detections from calcium, iron, silicon, and oxygen. Um, and what we're able to see here is that the iron and the upper limit on nickel tell us that this planetary body has accreted, sorry, this white dwarf has accreted a planetary body that was very, very depleted in iron rich material, just like the mantle of our Earth. So what we think is going on here is that it's accreted a mantle rich fragment of a larger planetary body. And what's even neater is that um, we can use the 
geological properties that lead to the precise um, abundances of things like nickel, iron, chromium, silicon during the formation of that iron mantle to tell us more about the history of those planetary bodies. And in fact, what it's going to tell us is it's going to tell us how big was that original parent body that formed an iron core and then had lots of collisions and then those fragments ended up in the atmosphere of the white dwarf. Um, and I'm going to kind of explain in detail how it, how it told us, but it's quite complex, so bear with me. Okay, so the key elements here to think about are things like iron, nickel, chromium and silicon, because they behave differently during that, the formation of those iron droplets that sink to the core of that planetary body. The nickel and the chromium and sometimes a little bit of silicon is added to those iron droplets and the exact amount that's added depends on the pressure, which in turn depends on how large that planetary body was. Um, yeah, so this was all published in a paper by um, Andy earlier this year. Um, so please do read it or talk to him more about that. Okay, so we imagine we start off with our planetary body and all of these dots are some nickel that happens to be in it. We're just using a cartoon here to just focus on nickel for now and highlight what's going on with the nickel. So it's spread out uniformly. That planetary body is now going to be heated up. It's going to have a magma ocean phase and it's going to differentiate and form that iron core. So the iron will sink with the nickel to the center. But different things are gonna happen depending on whether this planetary body was something like an asteroid with low mass and low pressure, or whether it was something big like Earth or a moon with high mass and high pressure. So if it's small, the nickel goes almost entirely to the core. If it's a bit larger, the nickel is mostly in the core, but more is left in the mantle. So that means that then, when we fragment these bodies due to collisions and some of those fragments end up in the atmospheres of these polluted white dwarfs, depending on whether we end up with a fragment of core or a fragment of mantle material, we can end up with something which has a very, very high, very, very high nickel or actually a really low nickel in the mantle. And that tells us about it being something that was originally more low mass, more like an asteroid. Um, whereas, sorry, I can't see. Um, if, if it was high nickel, not quite as high nickel, then it tells us that actually this was something that was bigger and maybe more like the size of a moon when it entered the atmosphere of the white dwarf. Um, so unfortunately, here comes the kind of um, crux moment. We really need to have a serendipitous observation of a white dwarf that's accreted something that's incredibly core rich or incredibly mantle rich with really good sensitivity to nickel or chromium um, if, we're, if we're actually going to be able to sensitively detect, deduce the mass of the original body. So Andy found four objects where he was able to put some broad constraints on what he thinks most likely to be going on. But for none of these can we kind of um, confidently say absolutely. Um, but it's a very interesting object, book WD0449 from Andrew Swan's work, um, where the high nickel abundance points towards low masses that's kind of more like asteroidal masses. Um, and this is the posterior distribution from Andy's Bayesian model um, as a function of pressure or the mass of the body. Um, and it shows that we're kind of headed towards asteroids, but actually these effects are really most sensitive when we're talking about things in the range of kind of moon masses compared to terrestrial masses. Okay, so I'm gonna finish my whistle top whistle stop that tour there with a kind of brief summary. Um, but hopefully I've told you some exciting things that you would like to learn more about. So I started out by telling you about Mark Brow's work on how to pollute a white dwarf, and in particular that we need to have collisions um, and collisions of fragments could be induced by planets or by GR, general relativistic precession, and that those are crucial in the process of getting an asteroid onto a white dwarf. I then talk briefly about Laura's work, where we're going to be probing the volatile history of some planets in seven highly polluted white dwarfs. Um, more to come um, soon. Um, I highlighted John Harrison's work on producing Bayesian models to explain the abundances observed in white dwarf atmospheres. And if anyone's interested in using those, please do get in touch. And then I talked about how we can use these white dwarfs to probe both the volatile history of a planetary body, but also its geology and whether it's formed an iron core, and how we can use wide binaries, um, companions to polluted white dwarfs, to tell us about how planet formation potentially alters planetary compositions. Um, and that's, yeah, 
also there'll be more work on that in the future um, and I just finished up by talking about Andy's work on how we can look into how large the white dwarf pollutants are based on abundances of iron nickel and chromium and silicon and how they behave slightly differently under core mantle differentiation depending on how big that body was um, yeah so thank you all for your attention um, and I'm very happy to take questions to discuss things and so on so. Yeah, thank you very much, Amy. Um, we have time for one or two quick questions. You can um, raise your hand again or type in the chat. Yeah, one question by David Wilson. Yeah, hi, Amy. Um... <laughs> I was just wondering, um, in the, the binary study, you assume that the, well, I assume you assume that the uh, composition of the plant, of the plant intestinal hasn't changed since its formation. Yet in other studies, you assume that it does to, to be able to say, oh, this, this is core material, this is mantle material. How do you kind of square the two? How do you know that the, the object in the binary system hasn't changed and therefore it's matched to the star is coincidence or the opposite way around, if you've found a binary uh, system where the composition of the uh, planet intestinal didn't match the star, how could you say, oh, this is a result um, saying that planets don't match their stars rather than it's changed its composition? Thank you, David. Super, super interesting question and a very poignant point. Um, so I think actually what I'm hoping, David, is that when we do find in the binary systems that we do find some where the abundances are different from the stars, and they are different in ways that we understand from that geological process of core formation that can only change certain elements in certain ways. And likewise, the processes of volatile loss that contain, can change the abundances of certain elements in certain ways. And we have models that describe where we think those abundances could go and which changes. And so, so long as those processes are happening in ways that kind of fit with the models, then it's good. It's when they happen in totally different ways, then we think, actually, this is really exciting. We've got something new to learn, or our models are wrong. Okay, um, then let me thank you again for your talk, and we will move to the um, breakout sessions now. Just... Cool, I'll stop sharing.